All right, well, we might, um, we might get started. Um, I'd just like to welcome everybody tonight to our um, briefing on the coronavirus. Um, my name's Scott White. I'm the Communications Manager with the Primary Health Network. Um, welcome everybody here that's online, uh, in person and those people that are online. Before we do start, I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land that we're not just meeting on tonight but across our whole region because we're broadcasting to a wide audience. So I'd like to welcome all um, any Aboriginal people that are with us tonight and pay my respects to Elders past and um, future. So welcome. Um, our format for tonight will be um, um, Kat and um, Tony will come up and give a PowerPoint presentation, probably should go for 10 or 15 minutes, um, and then we'll move to a panel um, format with um, Katie and Trisha also here will be able to answer your questions. For those people um, in the room, I've let you know in terms of asking your questions um, so that they can be held online heard online. For those people that are, are registered online, hopefully you should have received some information on Slido, so we'll be using Slido tonight. You can type questions into Slido and we'll hear them, we'll, we'll receive those online here and then we'll be able to answer those as well. If you are also using Slido um, online, there is at the end there's a feedback um, section there, so it'd be really appreciate if you could give um, some feedback there. And one of the things that would be really interesting, I think, to get feedback on how useful you found tonight's session in terms of, and maybe if you thought after tonight and after listening and um, being present for the presentation, whether you think we need future presentations or what sort of how regular the communication um, would be. As people would know at the moment, and we'll get up later and tell everybody we're using Health Pathways to continually keep people updated with, with all the information. We're trying to use that as the one source of um, information for you all to go to Health Pathways that rather than bombarding you with um, emails because the certainly our panel members would know that they're probably getting half a dozen emails a day um, with a lot of information and we certainly don't want to bombard people with that and clog up your inbox and you're having to decide what you read and not. So we'd really prefer just to use Health Pathways. So thanks very much um, for that. And I will now call on um, Tony and Kat. Terrific, Scott, thank you very much. And a huge thank you for everyone who's joined us, so people who are online, and I think there are more than 100 uh, people online, that's fantastic, and there's a great turnout here in the room. And if you're online, I'm not sure if you can get a sense of the room, it does feel like we're in the United Nations. It's a superb <laughs> building, all the delegates are in high back chairs and looks to, look to have instantaneous translation services <laughs> in play. We, we want it to be as interactive as we possibly can, so thanks for coming enormously beneficial to us to get a sense of what the questions are and clearly uh, we'll do our very best to answer your questions tonight and if there are things left over at the end we'll get back to you with um, questions taken on notice. Terrific. So the, the purpose of this first bit is just to give you a brief overview of, of where we're up to what we think are some of the, the kind of key elements but we're very keen then for you to take us in whichever direction is most helpful for your, uh, for your practice and the kind of issues that you're facing and Kat and I are going to share the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So first of all coronavirus, look there are seven coronaviruses that uh, infect humans but hundreds and hundreds of coronaviruses out there uh, in the animal kingdom so this is a well recognised zoonosis as you're aware and what a range of extraordinary animals obviously uh, bats and snakes, civet cats we got to hear about uh, back in SARS, camels but dogs and cats um, and what are they? Pangolins now in the news as well. So coronavirus is um, extensive uh, in, uh, in nature but seven in humans and these are the four that we get to see each winter. So these are the common cold coronaviruses which uh, are on the mild end of the spectrum and of course in the last couple of decades we've met um, the miserable variants of coronavirus in the past and these were uh, MERS and SARS and it's worth reflecting on them briefly. Clearly we've looked at the experience with MERS and SARS in terms of what potential this new coronavirus has. MERS is a, an ongoing issue of course um, and of the, uh, of the 2,500 odd cases about a third have died so this was a, a clearly 
a, uh, a really serious infection to have with big outbreaks in Saudi Arabia and uh, Republic of Korea and is ongoing. And SARS, many of we've been talking about with many of you tonight will remember from the early 2000s, um, we've surpassed the number of cases and deaths that SARS inflicted at, at that time. Uh, and the, the case fatality ratio for SARS was similarly disastrous at around the kind of 10% level. Uh, and that was brought under control uh, back in the early 2000s. So coronaviruses have form. What do we know about the seventh human coronavirus? So we've heard about the naming convention today, coronavirus disease this time around, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, the virus may well be known as SARS-CoV-2, but we'll wait and see whether that sticks. That sounds like a real mouthful. Where have we been in terms of um, this experience? A lot's happened in two months. There's a brief um, timeline there uh, on your screen. Welcome. And uh, so first case back in mid-December, notified of the cluster of pneumonia cases out of China at the end of December, identified mid-January. First cases outside of uh, of mainland China in the middle of January and we got our first case um, towards the end of, of January and there's been a rapid progression since then. Lots of you will have seen this page I imagine from the Johns Hopkins um, University, great source of, of data which we recommend to you. I know lots of you will have it on refresh in the background. I took this screenshot yesterday, it's clearly well out of date already, cases past um, 45,000 deaths past 1,100, but a really helpful source of information. The map doesn't quite do it justice. Outside of mainland China, we know there are cases in at least 24 other countries, plus uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan and Macau, um, and transmission in 11 or 12 of those. So this is already very much an international problem, of course. Uh, and that's the epi curve. Don't be too reassured by that little plateau at the end. That's just the data catching up. And so relentlessly upwards, this is very much an outbreak um, that is still uh, uh, progressing, uh, progressing rapidly. What's happening in Australia? Um, so here's the epi curve, the, the chart of Australian cases by their onset. So there have been 15 cases in Australia spread across um, four states. You can see four for New South Wales. We, uh, we started um, Australia's experience. And you'll note that the, very, the last case in New South Wales uh, had their onset on the 23rd of January. So we're now uh, almost three weeks past that time. There's been no transmission in Australia, so the, all of these cases acquired their infection overseas, 12 in Wuhan, 3 in mainland China, so no transmission inside Australia and no healthcare workers in Australia infected. And so clearly here uh, we believe is good evidence of the containment measures that are in place at the moment having a really beneficial impact on the Australian experience. What about clinical features? Um, this is a, a summary of the 12 Australian cases, so it's a small group, but gives you just a sense of the kind of uh, uh, picture clinically that clinicians have faced in Australia. I'll show you one for a, a big Chinese case series next. So fever, uh, common, cough, some upper respiratory um, symptoms. In this case series, interestingly, about a third had diarrhoea, um, headache, pneumonia, shortness of breath. So it's, a, it's very much a respiratory illness and fever featured heavily in this Australian series. This is a, a Chinese series, so this is a, about 1,100 cases uh, from hospitalised people, so necessarily selecting at the more severe end of the spectrum. A couple of things to point out, uh, point out here. Fever is common but it's not universal. Fever appears twice in this chart. Ultimately, uh, nearly 90% of cases had fever but only half that number at presentation to hospital. So you will have noticed that the case definition changed in Australia um, in the last two weeks. And so uh, Kat will cover this again, but the clinical part of the case definition includes fever or respiratory symptoms. So just plain respiratory symptoms without fever is enough to get your interest if there's a travel exposure or fever alone without respiratory um, symptoms. So this is a a, a, a pathogen that's presenting in a variety of ways. That's fever, cough common. Uh, in this case series, less than 5% uh, 
had diarrhoea. So after SARS, which was spread through gastrointestinal route as well as respiratory route, great interest to see whether that was at play here and no evidence of that being a serious factor at the moment, but that's a, an ongoing watching brief. So that's the experience out of there. In terms of severity of illness, the picture that's emerging is of a pathogen that's uh, less serious uh, or severe clinically um, than SARS, perhaps more infectious. About 82% of cases in the, the Chinese e e mainland experience at the mild end of the spectrum. So we should be on the lookout for mild illness and the case definition very specifically envisages that possibility that the first person you see with this novel coronavirus might have quite mild respiratory illness. So um, the bulk of cases at that end of the spectrum, um, severe requiring admission, often with pneumonia, about uh, a sixth of all cases. And the images there, chest X-ray and the CT, pictures of really nasty viral pneumonia with a classic ground glass appearance on the CT. So viral pneumonia, definitely a big part of the picture for the severe end of the spectrum, about 3% uh, requiring ICU admission. So it's hard to make sense of the mortality data at the moment uh, in terms of uh, the accuracy there. Clearly um, there are challenges in terms of capturing all of the milder cases that might be out in the community in China. We're necessarily seeing the more severe end of the spectrum. And it takes a while uh, from the time people become infected with this novel coronavirus and for those who are going to succumb. Often that takes two weeks, so there's a delay in the the death data coming through to catch up with the incident cases. Best estimates uh, have the case fatality ratio well lower than uh, SARS, um, which as I said earlier was around about the 10%. And uh, it, it may be that uh, this novel coronavirus ends up around the somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5, but we'll, we'll have to watch and see where that goes. In terms of context, seasonal flu sits at around 0.14%, so about 14 in a 1,000 people die um, from the, the, the flu that we see each winter. So substantially worse than that, but not in the same ballpark as, as we experience with SARS. So watching brief. All right, and then the last one, uh, last slide from me, just a, a brief comment. Clearly this has uh, been a highly infectious virus in the Chinese experience and estimates of the reproductive number, the RO, so how many new cases does one infected person generate? And uh, the estimates there between uh, 1.4 and 2.5 uh, additional cases. Now clearly that hasn't been the experience in Australia with the kind of infection control and, and um, uh, measures that are in place at the moment. So this will be a, a critical area for us to watch um, in the time ahead. And, um, and there's currently no established uh, treatment for people who have this coronavirus infection. And there's been lots of talk about vaccine and heroic efforts underway, but it's likely a candidate vaccine for this condition is, is a good 18 months or more away. And with that, I shall hand you over to Kat. Thank Thanks, you. Tony. Um, so similarly, I'm a public health physician working with Tony at the Hunter New England Health Population Health Unit. And we thought that we'd just change gears a little bit now and think about the kinds of inquiries and questions and assessment of patients that are presenting to general practice. Um, so obviously there'd be a lot of questions and discussion around um, how to triage these inquiries. And generally speaking, they probably fall into three main buckets. Um, so there's Inquiries of a general nature, you know, um, can I travel, I've travelled, I've got a friend, you know, what are the symptoms of coronavirus? And certainly our lines were being flooded with these calls in the early stages, um, but given that this is a national issue, uh, the Commonwealth Government has now established a national coronavirus info line. So we'd encourage you to make use of that if you are getting those sorts of calls coming through, um, mm -hmm. that you can just uh, redirect people onto that line. Um, then obviously there are people that um, don't have any symptoms, but for want of a better term, we're calling them on the watch list. Hopefully that's not too perjurative, but essentially people who may be at risk of incubating um, novel coronavirus um, because they may have had some exposure, which is either known or unknown. Um, so these are well people that we're talking about, but they're people that due to their epidemiological story, um, they've had some sort of exposure that may place them at risk for um, coming into contact with the virus. 
And in general terms, um, we would recommend that these people need information about the disease, um, uh, ideally in their preferred language, um, that they be advised to monitor themselves for symptoms and that they have good advice about what to do if they develop symptoms. Um, and a subset of these people also have been recommended to be under self-quarantine. And we will go into this in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Um, then the third broad category is people who are unwell, who essentially are coming to you saying, I think I might have coronavirus. Um, so obviously these people need some form of clinical assessment and there are a range of pathways to do this. So they don't necessarily have to see you. Um, again, a process has been established enabling phone assessment of these people. So Health Direct, which you may be familiar with is sort of the out of hours um, a call service where people speak to registered nurses. Um, the 1800-022-222 number can assess with phone assessment of these um, people with coronavirus queries um, and then we'll redirect them to the appropriate uh, facility based on their symptoms. Um, we will go into a little bit more detail if these people um, sort of lob up on your doorstep or if they, you know, if they present requesting clinical assessment to your practices. Um, but generally speaking, they're sort of the, the three categories of coronavirus inquiries that, that we've been dealing with at the public health unit. So just delving a little bit into the watch list now. So again, um, I'd reinforce that these are asymptomatic. So these are well people. Um, the first category is return travellers. And the travel restrictions or travel advisories were an evolving um, sort of story with the evolving clinical and epidemiological picture. So it started off with... Uh, restrictions applying to people who had been to Hubei province, which is where Wuhan, the city where this outbreak originated, is located. So anyone who had travelled to or transited through Hubei is subject to a 14-day isolation requirement, and this is anybody. Um, subsequent to this, on the 1st of February, these restrictions were broadened, so exclusion criteria, to anybody who departed mainland China on or after the 1st of February, and some additional restrictions on movement from the 1st of February were put into place, so the volume of people coming um, since then has substantially declined as well. Um, and then there was a third group of people who sort of somewhere in the middle of all those policy announcements um, were advised to self-isolate as well. And you may have seen, you know, some inquiries relating to going back to school and, and those sorts of things. So um, I think we're now coming to the end of that period for when those um, exclusions were enforced. But essentially, um, anybody who had travelled to mainland China who fell into a vulnerable population where they could potentially spread the disease um, were they to develop it quite quickly. Um, so healthcare workers and school students are the ones that, that spring to mind were advised to voluntarily self-isolate for 14 days. And that's based on the um, sort of the widely accepted incubation period of 14 days. In reality, the median incubation period is probably much shorter than that. Okay, so that's those people. Um, a second group of people that we want to keep a close eye on, a watching brief on, are contacts of confirmed cases. Now, there is some speculation about contacts of uh, suspected cases, but I'll park that to one side. We're now just talking about people who have had contact with a confirmed case. Um, and as Tony pointed out in his summary, in New South Wales, we have only had four cases. Um, and the, the onset of the last one of those was quite some time ago. So this is probably not relevant at this stage, but may become relevant um, if and when community transmission is established. So um, broadly speaking, contacts fall into two categories. All contacts need to be monitoring themselves for 14 days following their last contact with an infectious case, um, but only close contacts are the ones that need to actually isolate themselves while they're monitoring for symptoms. So when we're talking about close contact, it's essentially face-to-face, um, -face, up close and personal. Um, it's prolonged contact, so things like household members or for longer than two hours in a closed space. So that's, you know, things like, um, you know, large waiting rooms and things like that, longer than two hours. Um, or we're talking about, you know, long haul flights, the sort of two rows in front, behind and the adjacent seats on a plane. Um, in terms of casual contact, um, 
a lot of the contact would fall into into this category. So this is brief face to face, so less than fifteen minutes, um, and also healthcare workers that are wearing appropriate PPE are classed as casual contacts. So uh, you know, again, there's advice to <coughs> monitor for symptoms for all contacts, but mm -hmm. um, the restrictions are only advised for those that have had close contact with confirmed cases. Moving on now to the assessment of people with symptoms. So those are all well people who are under isolation or shall we say more technically quarantine um, because they may develop disease in the future. This is now assessment of people who present with symptoms. And um, the case definition was something of a moving feast, but it has remained stable for the last week, I think. Um, and so we would really emphasise that patients need to have both epidemiological criteria, so they need a good story, um, and also clinical criteria, so symptoms. Um, so focusing on the epidemiological criteria, this is in the 14 days prior to when they developed symptoms. They need to have had to travel to mainland China and or contact with a confirmed case while the case was infectious. Um, I won't go into detail about that, but we can talk about that afterwards if, there's, if there are questions. Um, in terms of the clinical criteria, you'll notice that they are quite broad. So um, it can be anybody who has a fever in isolation, so they don't even need respiratory symptoms. If they have a fever with this travel history, then they would be uh, fit the suspected case definition for this novel coronavirus or um, acute respiratory symptoms. Um, and the example that's given here is cough, shortness of breath. Obviously, there are some clinical judgments that need to be applied for lesser, you know, upper respiratory symptoms. Um, but we can also talk about that in more detail if there's interest. So what do you do if you have a suspected case? Um, so testing initially was just sort of being recommended to happen through, oh dear. Okay, we've got a fire alarm, but it stopped. <laughs> okay, so for a suspected case, um, as I said, initially testing was being recommended um, primarily through emergency departments, and that's still a very val valid referral pathway if your practice is not properly equipped um, to assess uh, these people with appropriate personal protective equipment and um, infection prevention and control in place. But um, the testing uh, is gradually being brought online at multiple labs to facilitate people's access to testing. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of interest and demand in testing. And um, so for mild people who are mildly unwell, there is a uh, recommendation that if you as clinicians feel confident and have the appropriate infection prevention control measures in place, so that's standard contact and droplet precautions when you're collecting specimens off the patient, um, that you can collect them in your practice. Alternatively, there are a number of pathology collection centres um, that have put processes in place to be able to safely collect samples of um, suspected novel coronavirus patients. Um, and there is a list on the New South Wales Health website of the collection centres that are offering that service at this time. Um, Yes, yes, we will give a plug to the Health Pathways. Um, so everything is on Health Pathways and we'll make these slides available. Uh, when we're talking about people with more severe illness, so this is people with, you know, um, a, a very productive cough or critically unwell, um, essentially, and you probably all um, agree with this in terms of common sense, um, we're suggesting that you just refer them straight to an emergency department for assessment and testing. Um, and a more stringent level of infection control is recommended for those patients, so airborne precautions, which is often not practical in a primary care setting. So for all of those reasons, um, it's probably most appropriate to refer them to an emergency department, but call ahead to the emergency department to say that there is a suspected case coming in so that they can um, prepare with their um, appropriate infection prevention control precautions. Uh, in terms of the nitty gritty of what testing is advised, and this would have come out in the GP alert as well. Have we, oh yes, uh, question. So I've got some on staff. Maybe oh, can you? Them. Sorry. <laughs> I've got some on staff. Maybe I want to send them to the emergency department. Yes. How's the South Wales Ambulance Service going to deal with that? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Trish, should I flick to you for that? Well, oh. if we could do that, we're just, um, we are going to juggle microphones. Yes, is it? And that's why uh, we'll do the, will we break to an introduction too? Because I didn't do that at the start. Sure, we put let's in do that. Go on. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Trish, do you want to introduce yourself and then... Uh, hi, I'm Trish Kaboviak. I'm one of the clinical nurse consultants for the Infection Prevention Service based at John Hunter Hospital. Um, so should a patient require ambulance transfer, um, it's really based on a risk assessment and the use of PPE. So what you would be doing with that patient is ensuring that they have a mask on um, and a surgical mask should be sufficient. Um, preferably they perform hand hygiene before they get in the ambulance and then they'd be transported. Now the ambulance service um, would need to be notified when booking the ambulance as well and uh, they certainly have procedures in place for transporting patients with suspected coronavirus. Thanks Trish. And I guess we could make a comment too, we're challenging the camera folk, well done. Um, that depending how the person arrived at your practice, it, it may be perfectly reasonable for them to continue by that means. Um, if you know if uh, they brought themselves there or a family member who's already been with them in the car, so you can put them put a surgical mask on. So, yep, ambulance is a backup, but oftentimes for the non-severely ill people, there'll be the, the, their kind of usual measures as well. Great. Great question. Okay, so back to the actual testing. Um, uh, so we're looking for respiratory specimens, so two combined nose and throat viral swabs or um, two nasopharyngeal swabs or, and this is probably not appropriate again for the primary care context, a lower respiratory specimen sputum if the patient's coughing up sputum. Um, but as I said, you're probably not wanting to collect that. Um, and in terms of the request, obviously, uh, considering that we're in the peak of influenza season in the Northern Hemisphere, so considering your routine respiratory pathogens, maybe a respiratory multiplex, and then uh, requesting 2019 NCOV testing, although that might be COVID-19 testing now, I'm sure they'll understand, the lab will understand what you're requesting. So, um, we did touch on infection control and Trish might speak to this in more detail in the panel discussion. But essentially, the, the guidance from a national level, and this again is available on the Health Pathways site, is that for the patient, they should um, have a surgical mask applied if they've got symptoms. Um, and this applies also if you're conducting any routine care of people that are involuntary self-isolation on the watch list. So surgical mask for the patient, respiratory and hand hygiene, um, and direct to a single room. In terms of the people that are um, having contact with that patient, so where standard contact and droplet precautions for the patient if they've got a mild illness or if they're um, having routine care. And what that means in practice is a long sleeve gown, gloves, protective eyewear and a surgical mask for the attending staff. In terms of room cleaning and disinfection, there's uh, quite a good set of guidelines available um, at a Commonwealth level, again, linked on health pathways, but it's not routinely recommended if the patient has a mild illness, they've got the mask on um, and it's routine care and there's no aerosol generating procedures. And we can have a bit more of a discussion about what constitutes aerosol generating um, at a later stage. Okay, so we just thought we'd put this slide in optimistically or pessimistically, um, at some stage one of you may get a confirmed case, um, in which case novel coronavirus is a notifiable disease, so please give us a call on the 1300 number. And at this point in time, while we're still in containment phase, it's recommended that these patients be managed as an inpatient, but public health can facilitate that um, in conjunction with inpatient services. And further, there may be some contact tracing associated with that patient. Um, and, and will facilitate if and when it comes to that. So we thought we'd now break just to um, discuss some scenarios, just to sort of apply these principles. <coughs> and Tony, did you, am I just coming down? Yep. That sounds great. <laughs> Look, before we go on, we, now that we're all here with a microphone, we can um, complete the uh, introduction. So, Katie, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you. My name is Katie Lai, one of the infectious diseases physician from John Hunter Hospital. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Katie. Okay, so... Yes, okay. and and uh, Tony Merritt, so public health physician with with Cat. So th this uh, will start off the scenarios, and we've also got some other questions to follow. But please make it interactive and intervene and add your kind of nuances and finer points as we go. So th this scenario is um, uh, around Bill, who's a, a well-known 
patient at your practice. He's a, a businessman and he's just returned from a trip. Um, so he was in Beijing for most of the two-week time. He came through Hong Kong and, and Singapore and, and he arrived back on the 10th of February, so just a couple of days ago. And he developed a dry cough while he was on the plane uh, coming back to Sydney and he's now worse. He's got a low-grade temperature, 37.9, and he's got some myalgia and, and, and some aches. And Bill's at home still and he's rung your practice for an appointment. So I guess well, let's just think about exactly how we'd handle that scenario. Um, it'd be good for you to answer that question in your own head um, and then we'll flesh it out and see how that would happen around the room. But Katie, can I start with you? So in terms of suspected case definition, what, what would you make of this combination? In this case, Bill has uh, epidemiological criteria as well as clinical criteria. Um, so we can call this a suspected case. Um, so he returned back from mainland China and he does have um, low grade temperatures and he also has respiratory symptoms. So he, um, by definition, this will be a suspected case. So therefore, it's appropriate to test him. Reaching across. So Great, hang on. So you, do you want to use the microphone and we'll, we'll repeat it here in any case, but uh, when the red light's on, you're active. So given that we know that most of the cases are kind of mild and at the moment he's looking like he's got a relatively mild condition, it would be nice to maybe even suggest that he stays at home and self-manages rather than come into the clinic. My um, question is, do we have capacity for somebody to go out and swab him? Because I, I assume it's still important to swab. Um, but that would save him coming into our clinic and us having to worry about it. And to me, it seems like the safest option. But I just didn't know what our capacity was locally for that sort of response. Yeah, I think that is a great, uh, it's a great question and it, there's not a well-developed capacity for that at the moment, um, but that's a, a, a clearly a function that would work nicely. Let's consider the, that question in the context of the practice first. Um, and so, Trish, can I ask you, if you were giving advice to the practice around this person, just thinking about them and, uh, and them coming to the practice, what, what, what's your advice to this practice about how best to handle this situation? Um, so in the first instance, you'd be aware of the capacity for that practice for the use of single room. So um, before the patient comes in, um, you'd make sure that there would be no waiting time within common areas. Um, and so that when the patient was seen at the practice in the first instance, um, make sure that they uh, have access to a surgical mask um, and good hand hygiene to start things off, then place them in a single room until they can be um, clinically assessed. Um, and then uh, once the assessment starts, it would be the staff assessing the patient, um, you know, applying their PPE before they enter the room. Um, uh, certainly making sure they collect respiratory swabs if the illness is mild enough to collect them uh, within the practice. So when collecting the respiratory swabs, um, ensure that... Um, whoever is collecting the swabs isn't directly in front of the patient because sure enough, when you tickle people's tonsils, they're either going to cough or sneeze in your face. Um, and just remember that protective eyewear is very much part of PPE that is mandatory around control procedures for this. Um, so we're just assuming that Bill's uh, spit symptoms are still on the mild spectrum. Um, so uh, once Bill is well enough to go home after he's been tested, as far as uh, removing your PPE, you've got to be very careful about removing it so you don't cross-infect yourself uh, whilst you're doffing your PPE. Um, and then as far as cleaning the space, because we're classifying this as a mild illness, we would be uh, recommending the use of a disinfectant on the medical items that were used to assess the patient. So, um, you know, potentially a thermometer, any frequently touched surfaces that might have been used during the um, assessment, um, 
it would be a good idea to clean those as well. Um, but then once the patient has departed and uh, you've doffed your PPE, there's no reason why that uh, room can't be used straight away. So the guidelines at this stage say uh, that you don't need to quarantine that room for a period of 30 minutes prior to the next person using the space. Um, have I answered the question? <laughs> That's great, Tris. Sorry, I'm just going to interject here with a question online and then we've got another question up the back. Um, but just uh, on that topic of the distinction between people with mild illness and severe illness and what precautions are advised, there was a question online in terms of it was just said that a regular surgical mask will be sufficient, but the health updates have all said this needs to be an N95. So the question is about the health practitioner wearing either a surgical mask or a P2 mask. So at this stage, um, my understanding is it's based on the severity of the symptoms. Um, if it's classified as um, severe disease, then we up the ante to airborne precautions. Now, um, I think the important part um, in this discussion is making sure that when the appointment's made, that you have an appropriate triage for the patient that is giving this type of history. Um, so if during that triage of the um, uh, appointment allocation, um, you do deem that this may be actually severe rather than mild illness, um, I would be saying maybe the best place for this patient is actually um, a healthcare facility where we're ready with things like negative pressure rooms um, and staff that are, you know, assessing and ready to uh, isolate the patient right from the word go. Is this for me? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Um, I heard that the medical practice in Eastwood that had a confirmed case that both the practice and the pharmacy was closed for some time um, after they'd been there. Um, and I guess that scares people that think that they might have to close their practices. Is that still what's happening? Yeah, great question. And, and clearly those cases you could see from the, um, the epicurve, the uh, New South Wales experience was right at the early days, like at, at New South Wales had the very first case in Australia, um, at a time when we knew way less than we do now um, and we're still steeply on the learning curve. And, um, and so there was a highly precautionary approach taken in a whole um, number of spheres in those early cases. We have a much better understanding now that, um, that for people uh, in far and away the majority of circumstances, people with this novel coronavirus infection, that transmission risks are through surfaces and through droplet spread. Um, and clearly we're concerned about aerosolising experiences um, and, and situations and that's um, where we, we, we touch into that when we've got severe illness with people coughing and spluttering and certainly if there were circumstances with people being intubated and ventilated and, and so forth. But to answer your question, no, so if, if somebody came through a general practice here in Newcastle with a typical illness um, and um, was mild enough, like it sounds Bill is, to go home and be managed at home, or even if it was appropriate, they are redirected to the emergency department. And we found out they were a case the next day when the, the result came back, there would be no implications for your practice and your practice would not be closed. Yep. And the only circumstances where there'd be a constraint on use of a space, as Trish has covered, if, if there was a, a fear that an aerosolising practice or experience had occurred, so somebody who was really ill and, and coughing and spluttering a lot, um, then exactly as we do with somebody who has measles, which is airborne, okay, so we apply the, the highest, most stringent criteria, including airborne, to infectious measles cases. And in that circumstance, um, we would want to keep any space that an infectious measles per, uh, case had been in clear for 30 minutes um, so that that risk had passed and we would do the same. Yep. But no, your, your practice won't be, uh, won't be closed. And I think there was a question here. Just pop your speaker on. This is just going back to the patient journey sort of thing. We've triaged the patient um, and we've determined that they're a possible coronavirus patient. We want them to come into the clinic. They won't have a surgical mask at home, but a lot of our clinics will require patients to walk through public areas to get to us. Is there a homemade mask version that they could use to get to see us? A, sorry, a homemade mask. Oh, aren't there some great pictures online? But they're not going to help us in this circumstance. No, I, I guess, but I think there are practical things you could do at a surgery. So I know some surgeries 
have um, surgical masks really at, at the entranceway when people come in. I know that some people are, are actually meeting people in the car park um, and making sure a, a mask is provided before people come into the building. And a, so just to be clear, a surgical mask on the person with suspected um, uh, this novel coronavirus is appropriate throughout and most of the time that'll be right for all of us as healthcare workers and there'll just be those circumstances where we severe disease and we've got concerns about aerosolising where it's appropriate to upgrade to the P2 or N95. So I, th I think there are ways around managing that transit but just take it some forethought and some planning. If anyone's got any other kind of innovations in the practice... Um, Dr Merritt, in the same, it's in a similar sort of direction, the concern I have is is we we know by phone that we've probably got a case in a house somewhere um, and there's probably some other members in that household and then you're about to put the index case into a car with other people, probably with the kids too because they're all going to... So you're in a confined space. And I guess the thing which I don't understand as, as the GP is... What's my hit rate like if if this case is mild, moderate sort of case, um, and we do put that that fellow in the car with his kids and so forth, are they all likely to end up with this? And so we're actually worsening the situation just by bringing him to the surgery, or or, or is that an unfounded level of concern because it's not as perhaps um, a higher hit rate as something like measles, which we know is very high. Oh, sure. Um, so it's a great question. I mean, in this particular scenario, Bill would be subject to the um, voluntary self-isolation or quarantine requirements. So there is some good guidance for people that are, um, you know, asymptomatic return travellers in terms of, you know, they should be staying out of common areas, which is very hard with kids, staying out of common areas, um, you know, having a mask on when they're interacting with other people, staying in their own room as much as possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, probably those household-like contacts are going to be contacts of that person, whether they're in a car or sharing the household with him, living with him. Um, it, so it's a good question. Just, just coming back to this other uh, thought about patient journey and maybe ways of avoiding mild cases from coming into the surgery after you've done a phone assessment, um, now that we have the private pathology collection centres that have come online that are established to do that, um, and unfortunately we don't have a laboratory representative here, but it may be possible to fax a request form and phone ahead to the pathology centre and just send the patient directly there for collection, I'm thinking. Mm. Great. Patty. Uh, thanks, Tony. Great presentation. Um, Katie and Trish, would you be happy if we took this call in general practice to just refer this patient straight to the hospital? And... Kat and Tony, if you had the same scenario but Bill had not been to Beijing, he just transited through Hong Kong or Singapore, what, what would our response be? So it depends on um, the risk assessment or your information on the phone already. So if, um, so if there's suspicion that the illness is not that mild, then um, um, it's very reasonable to send the patient straight to emergency department. So um, and. Also, the capacity of your GP practice, if, um, if there's uncertainty in terms of how you can manage the patient at your practice, um, so do not hesitate in sending the patient to emergency as well. And we usually, uh, we would appreciate a phone call in advance as well, so to our triage. I can agree. Yeah, <laughs> oh, sure. So it's great. I like the way this scenario is kind of evolving to cover lots of the kind of areas that we're, we all have an interest in. Stephanie, do you want to jump in? Just one quick question about Bill arriving in Australia with that travel story. Wouldn't he have been picked up at the airport? He's got a cough that he developed on a plane. No, I didn't. He, well, Bill had a lot to do. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. But, but and, aren't, aren't, and it was a dry, occasional mainland. cough. Aren't all arrivals from mainland China being screened in some way at the airport? Yeah, so they'll, they'll be subject to uh, answering uh, yeah. questions. And, and, and so if you tick the box, if you tick the box saying, I've got a cough, what would happen to him then? Yeah, so at the moment, um, people would, there's a, a, a series of a clinics set up in Sydney, there's one at RPA, mm -hmm. and, and there's a steady stream of, of folk from the airport who get tested before they go anywhere right. else. So, yep. so the. Practically, we may not ever see someone like Bill with that sort of a story because 
he may have been picked up already. That's true. There's a variation yeah, on this one where his cough started the next day. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And um, he was maybe a bit tired on the flight coming back, but it, now he's got a low-grade <laughs> fever. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and so, Paddy, you asked the um, the good question. What, so, this one, as you said, Caddy, th this gentleman, Bill, clearly meets the the criteria as a suspected case. He's been in mainland China, and he's he's returned. Uh, his symptoms have started within fourteen days of of his return, and those clinical features meet the clinical elements of the case definition. But with those um, symptoms without mainland China, so where do we go um, there? And you will have been subject to the case definition changing over the last um, four weeks, although as Kat said earlier, this one's been stable now for a while. Critical that we keep an eye on this. It's um, the map we showed earlier with 24 countries with cases. There is a lot of activity particularly closer to, to China, so Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Macau, all with significant numbers of cases. So it's entirely possible that the criteria we apply, the case definition, the testing criteria, do change over the days and weeks ahead. It would be extraordinary if they didn't, and I know you've all been terrific at keeping uh, up to date with you with the, the news that comes out. So it may be if we were having this discussion next week um, that simply moving through some countries outside of China is enough to trigger testing. Uh, but look, we, as a general rule, we apply carefully the criteria that apply at the time. There's a great deal of lenience in terms of the symptom spectrum. So this is the, the case definition, but people who've come out of mainland China with symptom onset in the last 14 days, we've, we've as we spoke about earlier, the symptom profile can be quite mild. And so um, plenty of leeway in terms of testing milder uh, patients that the labs are happy to do that work. For the people whose exposures don't meet the EPI criteria, then um, then that may be something that changes in coming days, but we wouldn't be pushing to have those people tested at this stage. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Tony. So I'm just mindful of time, so we might wrap up on Bill, but there was one question online in terms of if Bill is positive for COVID-19 and managed at home and has a wife and three children, are they quarantined at home the length of his infectivity and for 14 days? So that's a great question um, and we haven't gotten into that situation yet, but essentially the guidelines state that from the last contact with the infectious case, um, household contacts need to be quarantined for 14 days. So, yes. Um, so, I'll just move on to the... That was the straightforward scenario. <laughs> great, great, great question. Great. Um, hopefully this one will get you chatting as well. So, here we've got Sandy, who's a medical student. She lives with her parents who returned from a two-week holiday in Shanghai, um, returning on the 5th of Feb. Her parents remain asymptomatic, um, but they're following their home isolation procedures. And Sandy has now presented to your practice with a headache and a sore throat. So... <laughs> Kat, this is a great question for you. Uh, I think I'll flip it over to you, Tony. Oh, OK. <laughs> so, uh, um, so this is a, a great question that starts to test sort of some of the, the boundaries here. Where, and I think there's some really important points. So. Um, first of all, Sandy is in a clinical placement in her medical term, so she's a healthcare worker and really important to keep that in mind and all healthcare workers who've returned from China in the last, uh, mainland China in the last two weeks are already um, not involved in um, clinical care. So um, if that had been uh, Sandy as a traveller, we would be thinking about her that way. She hasn't travelled but her parents have and they're well. So Sandy's a contact of people who are in isolation who are well, so she doesn't feature in any of those kind of case definitions earlier. So in terms of Sandy being ill, she's got mild symptoms um, that uh, cl clearly she's got something going on there, but there is no epidemiological element to hers that, that triggers that suspect case definition. So she hasn't been in contact with a confirmed case and she hasn't travelled in the previous two weeks. So even if we were really lenient with her kind of clinical profile, she doesn't meet those EPI criteria. 
And um, so she, she wouldn't trigger the suspect case definition or even a very generous interpretation of testing criteria for novel coronavirus. And we're very open to discussions, but th we wouldn't be seeing Sandy's case uh, example here um, as a circumstance where, where testing for novel coronavirus was important. But it could get more interesting, Ken. So what, what, if, um, what if her parents had been unwell? Question, Tony, and I might um, hand over to our New South Wales health colleagues about that because that's an interesting space. <laughs> okay, um, um, so, if the parents become unwell, then um, we would suggest um, testing. So, because um, because uh, the parents meet uh, epidemiological criteria as well with the clinical criteria. So that means um, the parents become suspected cases as well. So we encourage them to be tested. Um, so from an infection prevention point of view, um, we then go into overdrive. Um, so uh, at this stage, we would probably start looking at where Sandy has been within the healthcare facility and just prepare ourselves for the onslaught. We'll be dancing in the aisles if it's a negative result and working very long hours if it's a positive result because we'd be doing contact tracing for everyone she came in contact with in the healthcare facility. Mm. So any other questions about that scenario? Uh, not so much the scenario, but more generally, public health ob obviously operates in a legal framework. At what point does compulsion kick in, particularly for patients who refuse testing or refuse directions to perhaps attend hospital, particularly if they're really sick? So um, uh, this disease is uh, now under the Public Health Act. It's a notifiable condition um, and so there would be powers under the Act, um, you know, if there was strong clinical and epidemiological suspicion to, to intervene, although I don't believe it has come to that at this point. No, and, and so often it's, it's handy to have the powers in reserve, and, but um, they so rarely are actually needed. So the same applies, for example, in infections like tuberculosis. But, but the Public Health Act does have a big stick, um, at both for cases and for contacts of confirmed cases in, in this circumstance. So there are remedies there, but um, almost always before we get to anything legal and public health orders, we manage to navigate a way through for, for the people in who pose the, the greatest concern so confirm cases and their close contacts so it's a important question and one which we're grateful not to have to exercise too often any any other questions on we've got some other questions we'd pre-prepared and then we'll throw it open and we'll welcome interruptions we might just move on your mic's still active there at the moment you're welcome to keep asking but Thanks, Tony. That, that's the end of the, the formal um, uh, presentation, but we thought we'd just throw open to a panel discussion. But just to make you aware of a number of resources that are available as well, um, uh, the PHN Health Pathways team has been very engaged in uh, getting a Health Pathways Live that tries to bring all of the relevant information together and, and step it through in a, in a logical format. Um, and that will be uh, continually updated as well as changes come in case definitions and testing definitions. Um, the RACGP has also compiled some resources on coronavirus that are relevant to primary care. Um, the CEC has a good link on infection prevention and control um, and also in, I suppose, the federal and primary care space, um, the Australian government has some good coronavirus resources. And of course, if you get stuck or there are curly questions, you can always ring us at the Public Health Unit uh, we're available 24 hours, seven days a week. So we might just go now to some panel questions. Great, look, I've got a couple here and I know there's more coming in. So please, everybody who is online, this is a great time to pop your questions on Slido and we'll get through as many as, as we can. Katie, I wanted to ask you, we've talked a lot about testing. Could you just give us a rundown on where the tests are going at the moment and how quickly can we expect to get results back? 
So at the moment, um, there are two reference laboratories in New South Wales doing um, this testing. Um, so they are Westmead ICPML Laboratory, as well as um, Prince of Wales Hospital, um, New South Wales um, Health Pathology Randwick. So the t these tests are done every day. Um, so they're routine weekday queries um, uh, to these laboratories. Um, so from our area, we're getting a, a 24 to 36 hour turnaround time on results on weekdays. Um, however, if urgent courier um, is considered, um, especially if the, your patient is very unwell, um, then um, um, then the risk, um, then or during weekends when the routine courier isn't available, so it can happen. Um, so these results are um, so may become available within four hours after the specimens actually arrive at the laboratory. Um, so the method of testing is a PCR testing. Um, so um, uh, a few weeks ago, um, they started off with pan-coronavirus PCR testing. So they're now more specific real-time PCR primer tests, primer sets available to detect the specific um, 2019 novel coronavirus um, tests. Um, um, so this, um, this plan to... Um, um, involve more public hospitals as well as the private sector in the future. Fantastic. Lots of great questions flying around. We talked a bit about the implications for the practice having somebody through earlier. Can, can I ask you if, if a clinician's involved with someone who turns out to be a confirmed case and that very often they'd be in the same space for more than 15 minutes, so potentially... Um, uh, tick that criteria in terms of being a close contact. What are the implications for a, a general practitioner in terms of them becoming a, uh, a contact of a case and might they be subjected to quarantine themselves? Thanks, Tony. That's a great question. So um, I suppose the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, so obviously there's sort of a case-by-case -case basis, but in terms of what's outlined in the guidelines, um, there are some criteria around face-to-face -face contact for more than 15 minutes. Um, and if, you know, if, as you say, the healthcare worker does fulfil the criteria for close contact, then yes, they would be subject to the quarantine uh, recommendations. And that actually dovetails into another question that we had online about you know, how long are people infectious for confirmed cases? And uh, best available evidence at the moment, we're taking a precautionary approach and going from 24 hours before the onset of symptoms in the case um, until, uh, I mean, it's thought to be 24 hours after the resolution of their symptoms. However, in practice, um, people are being required to have clearance specimens. This is actual cases. Um, to have clearance specimens before they're discharged from isolation. But that's a process that's still sort of being worked out while we're in this containment phase. Yep. So another strong argument for wearing PPE and being fully protected just to ensure you don't become a, a close contact and, and need to have that, um, that quarantine period as, as well. Well, perhaps a couple of questions that we know have been topical around isolation, coming out of uh, isolation and the issue of, of clearance certificates. So, um, Katie, I might start in terms of uh, people having a negative uh, result for COVID-19, NCOV or SARS-CoV-2. Um, um, once they've had a negative test, what are the implications for coming out of a, a period of, of quarantine or isolation? So there may be a couple of reasons why um, this individual needed to be quarantined in the first place. Um, so with, with the one negative result, um, we still need to see whether the patient or the individual needs to comply with the 14-day quarantine period. Um, so uh, whether this individual is a returned traveller from mainland China. So if the 14-day period is not expired, then the patient needs to remain in quarantine. Um, so the other circumstance is whether the, the individual is a, a contact of a confirmed case. So again, uh, the individual needs to comply with the 14-day quarantine period. Um, um, the other point is that if the individual becomes unwell after the negative result comes through, then we encourage the patient or the individual to be tested again um, uh, when the symptoms um, arise. 
So um, again, the patient needs to be in quarantine until further results come through and until the 14 days expire. And, and Kat, the issue of clearance certificates has, has come up um, repeatedly. Would you like to comment on, on what I is the place of a clearance certificate or what are the options available to people in terms of addressing uh, requests for clearance certificates that, that may be coming your way? And it would be interesting if there's experience in the room that we could share in a moment too. Thanks, Tony. Uh, certainly New South Wales Health has been trying to actively discourage the practice of um, uh, of businesses, schools, etc., requesting clearance certificates because that's creating a really unnecessary burden um, and really an unfulfillable burden on general practice because um, it's really not possible to, to clear somebody who is, you know, um, asymptomatic and has possible... Um, uh, is possibly on a watch list. So it's, um, it's really not something that we would advise. Some practitioners have talked about, you know, taking patients at their at their face value and saying, well, you know, they came back now and they've fulfilled the 14 days, so I'm going to write a certificate saying that they've done that. But, you know, why that needs to have a medical practitioner's sign-off is questionable. Um, but uh, certainly the use of swabbing to clear people is not a practice that is recommended. Um, there is a, qu a couple of questions online in terms of the performance of the test, in terms of do we really trust negative results? Um, and certainly there has been um, some contention, and Katie, you might want to speak to this as well, um, some contention in terms of people with mild symptoms possibly not initially swabbing positive. But again, this is really um, a, a matter of exercising clinical judgment and people who, you know, have a progressive illness, um, they might end up getting admitted for further observation and serial testing. But that's not really something that would be happening in a primary care setting and not something that um, would be happening in the setting of trying to clear asymptomatic contacts. Just remind me, I neglected to mention on one slide that um, there's some reassurance in just how many negative tests there are out there in New South Wales so far. So those four cases, but we're up around 700 people tested and negative um, across New South Wales um, since the concerns began. And, and in Hunter, New England, I think we're around the 28, 30 mark. So lots of people who have triggered concerns through the suspect case definition or close to and who've, who've tested negative. Um, and um, and we're, we're confident in those tests that have come through. But as Kat says, always a test's a test, and um, you always put it in the context of your clinical judgment in terms of interpretation. But um, Kat, would you like to comment further on tests? Um, I agree with what Tony and Kat just said. So it's important to be um, alert, um, and um, also because we don't know too much about this new virus, um, so things do evolve um, in terms of data available and evidence to um, support our management plan. So um, in terms of the negative testing, um, so but if the clinician is still highly suspicious because of the presence of epidemiological criteria or clinical criteria, then we would still support further testing. So um, as in nasal pharyngeal swab, on the next day, um, if the symptoms persist, even the, the previous day's result um, has been negative. So we, yes, we support further testing. Terrific, and we've, we're through, we'll, we'll refer to the online questions in just a moment, but um, Katie, I'm going to bounce back to you with one other question about resources, because you're, you're a great resource in the area in terms of looking at um, what New South Wales Health has made available in multiple languages. So would, would you like to comment about what is available online in terms of resources in, for, uh, for Chinese nationals in, uh, in Chinese language? Um, in, that might be valuable for practices to have in waiting rooms or available for patients? Sure. Um, my understanding is that um, so there is Chinese material available online uh, from the New South Wales Health website um, and also there are also printed posters available in Chinese um, um, and um, also interpreter service um, is readily available if the GP practice needs. So... Um, um, so also on, online, there are also Chinese videos um, for um, uh, patients' information available as well. 
Um, and the federal government also has put in um, resources in terms of like Chinese um, material online. And uh, Katie was very helpful in showing the quality of some of those resources early on and uh, prevented us from um, uh, releasing some less than perfect uh, text. So thanks very much for that. Kat, i going to pass to you for online questions. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I think that we have mostly covered... Are there any other questions from around the room for now? Oh, yes. Um, in Sydney, they set up a fever clinic and it's sort of inbuilt to most of us as GPs to not send things to hospital if we can avoid it, especially if we're thinking we're sending infectious people there. Um, what's the threshold for our region to set up that sort of thing that I'm sure most of us would be much more comfortable you know, deferring to for these patients? Look, certainly there's planning around um, capacity to do that, and, and just as we did in the, the um, H1N1 influenza pandemic, yep, and um, so there was experience in having dedicated areas for patients to be directed to at a number of the major emergency departments, so good practice, not so long ago. Um, what would be the trigger? Look, I think if things change and we move to more extensive transmission in Australia, that's likely to be something that, that moves impressively. And once there's sustained, uh, if there is, a move to sustained community transmission at some stage, then uh, I think you would see those clinics established um, promptly. Yep. So clearly behind the intention there is to um, both preserve the rest of the, the hospital system in terms of people coming and going and to unload um, general practices from, from some of that care so that usual care can continue as well. So the, the, the role of those clinics is very well understood and, and, um, and they, they would be put in place just as they have in Sydney given the, the kind of burden of testing that's going on there at the moment. Yep, great question. Great, yes. If we, <clears throat> if we happen to be doing the swabs, every laboratory has different swabs. Is there a standard swab that we are doing? We've got, Honey New England got red, Lavi's got green, um, Douglas have got yellow. Which one? <laughs> I think the important thing is to make, ensure that they're a viral swab, not a bacterial swab. Um, and the other important point is to take two sets, um, two sets of swaps at the same time. Um, the, uh, the reason is that we want to do the specific um, novel coronavirus testing as well as the R13 um, multiplex PCR testing um, for these travellers um, because it's winter in Northern Hemisphere, so influenza is quite prevalent at the moment. So it's important to rule out uh, respiratory pathogens. There are still a number of people tra um, travelling um, on cruises and to Europe via Hong Kong or Singapore um, who have a level of anxiety about what sort of masks they should be wearing and they're seeking advice from GPs. What should we be telling them? That's a great question. Um, I mean, in the first instance, we would be directing people to the Smart Traveller website for the travel advisories. Um, there are high-level meetings at a Commonwealth level that are happening daily to review the epidemiology and the travel advisories. Um, we do also have a slide, I think this relates to another question online in terms of, you know, where's the next epicentre going to be? Um, so you may be aware that Public Health England has recently broadened their criteria. So um, we, we can flick to that slide later, but they've brought into, you know, places like Japan um, and Singapore. Um, so it may be a matter of time before that's brought in to Australia, but the Smart Travel website is being sort of updated in real time with those Commonwealth policy decisions. Um, in terms of the protectiveness of... Um, masks and personal protective equipment for travellers. My understanding, and, and Trish might want to comment on this, but um, that it, you know, if anything, it may give a false sense of security. They're not really recommended for outside of the healthcare worker space. Um, certainly recommended for if people are symptomatic to stop them from transmitting to others. But in terms of protecting people from acquiring infections, it's just, you know, good respiratory and hand hygiene is my understanding. 
the use of the mask over time is, is the problem. Once you get um, moisture on the surface of the mask, um, that's efficacy for filtration um, reduces. So if people were wearing masks all day, every day, chances are that they wouldn't be very efficient anyway. So good standard practice. If you look at, you know, guidelines from the World Health Organisation, it's standard precautions are what we should be implementing in the first instance. Could I spell those out? Oh, <laughs> if I can. So there's, there's eight standard precautions. So hand hygiene, use of PPE, so based on a risk assessment, um, aseptic technique, which doesn't apply to uh, everyday people, uh, linen handling, waste management, um, respiratory etiquette, those are probably the standard precautions that apply to, you know, people outside of clinical practice, um, as far as I can remember. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So, you know, I, when I'm educating people, I usually say those things that your mother told you. You know, wash your hands after you've been to the toilet, wash your hands before you eat. You know, make sure you wash your vegetables, all those sorts of very standard practices. Avoiding live animal markets, I think, <laughs> is, is the other one. Um, there are a couple of interesting questions online coming from a regional context, and I'm aware that we do have um, coverage across the region. Um, so I might pass back to you, Trish. So this was a question about, in a small regional centre, if a case is picked up, so I assume this is a confirmed case, and the patient needs to be admitted, do they need to be transferred to a hospital with negative pressure rooms? So um, across the district, uh, the Infection Prevention Service has been looking at uh, provision of negative pressure where we don't have um, an allocated negative pressure 100% exhaust room. Um, so in most facilities, we can create negative pressure just by 100% exhausting the environment and ensuring that the door is shut. Um, and so uh, at all facilities across the district, the Infection Prevention Service is working with engineering to um, create a, a map our uh, capacity to create negative pressure in each facility. So it would be ideal to have a negative pressure room for airborne precautions. Um, however, we understand that the risk of transmission for this virus is mainly by droplets. Um, so if, um, if there's a resource issue, um, then it's... Um, really important to put a surgical mask on the patient um, and keep the patient in a single room and um, so and to adhere with standard and contact and droplet precautions all the time at least and with um, the high risk procedures being the aerosol generating procedures which we try to avoid so these procedures include intubation bronchoscopy and um, NIV um, yeah, nebulizations, of course. So um, we try to not um, uh, we try to discourage those procedures because that would uh, that could minimise the risk of transmission. Then, um, yeah. But if your facility um, does have um, airborne precautions and a negative pressure room, uh, it will be very appropriate. Thanks, Katie. Um, I might bounce back to you again for one about, this is our hypothetical case, Bill, um, a question about whether his pregnant wife and unborn child would be at any increased risk. Um. <laughs> yeah. um, so risk of coronavirus. Yeah, pregnancy. sure, sure. Um, okay, yeah. So, um, so that's Bill. Um, so, uh, Bill in the scenario. Um, so we say he's a suspected case, We're right? Calling him a real case. Now. A real case. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So, um, so pregnancy. Um, so the pregnant wife is still a close contact. So a close contact. Um, so of a confirmed case. So that means um, we still need to be. Uh, mindful about um, the risks, uh, the risk of transmission to the wife, um, but pregnancy per se um, does not actually um, increase the chance of the risk of transmission. So, to understanding, so the the um, from the available papers that we know of, uh, the age. So, the older the patient, the the higher the risk of um, having complications from this disease, 
and having comorbidities or chronic conditions will also make the patient more at risk of complications. Uh, but the pregnancy per se should not add extra risk, but being in close contact would make the wife more at risk of transmission, of course. Um, and the unborn baby, um, I cannot comment. Yeah. yeah. I think it's still too early to say. And in terms of the risks for pregnant women, um, the current advice is just that the fever is what poses a risk for um, pregnant women developing this disease. Okay. Um, are there any other questions around the room? Um, no, Tony, you can come and listen. Oh, oh sorry. Yes. Tony. Just as a general question from an epidemiological point of view, I hope this doesn't sound too cynical, how well do you trust the information coming out of your Chinese compatriots? Is it reliable? Oh, I think they're in an invidious situation with a really widespread infection. So it kind of depends what you mean about reliable. I think there's no doubt that what we see in terms of the counts in Wuhan, where they were just overwhelmed by massive numbers, is that that they're inherently unreliable because um, th these are the most severe cases. So they're, they're reporting the people who are coming through hospital, but almost certainly there are vastly more cases at a community level of mild disease which um, haven't been picked up. So, but, but that's what we expect at the start. It, it was exactly the same at the start of um, SARS, for example. The case fatality rate was even worse than you know that where where it landed up because the first cases you find out about are necessarily the more severe ones and expect that sort of experience in mortality to come down. So one of the first case reports out of Wuhan, you know, the mortality rate was 15%, and um, you know, horrifying. But just reflecting the fact that that's the most sort of severe early cohort. So uh, everyone expects, including the Chinese, that there's vastly more cases at a community level. And as the, the um, uh, virus has spread to other places, uh, other provinces in China and other countries, gives us an opportunity to understand that epidemiology, um, um, you know, much better. There's an interesting question here about the uh, the cruise ship, which we you know we watch with morbid um, fascination and enormous sympathy for the you know 2,700 um, people who are stuck on it. And it's a question about what are the implications as more cases come on, does the quarantine keep getting pushed out? Well, look, we, we don't have inside running there and it really depends how that group's cohorted. Are there some people who really have been quarantined for the whole time and, and can that be counted separately? But clearly it's bad news for the group who've, who've been exposed to more recent cases. So look, the, the information necessarily imperfect, um, but, but we're really getting fantastic flows of information both from China and from surrounding countries. And it's the kind of emerging picture that we'd expect. Um, yep. So, yeah, good question. Is it, is it? Um, so there's, oh, sorry, a question about, is there any role for antiviral treatments? So I might pass to Katie for that. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you for asking. So there's no specific antiviral treatment uh, for this new virus at the moment that we know of. Um, so the treatment um, remains um, to be supportive measures. Um, so however, there are a few antiviral medications that have been used in the Chinese studies or Chinese series. Um, um, uh, in one paper, the use of Kaletra or um, the protease inhibitor lopinavir with rutonavir um, was used in a number of Chinese patients, but uh, but it is still not sure whether there's actually any clinical benefit in the use of such a medication. Um, so the other medications that have been trialled or used um, include um, interferon. Um, so, uh, the role is unclear in SARS or MERS or in this new virus. Um, and also we know that riboflurane has been um, looked at, um, but the data seems to be um, uh, in vitro data. So again, we do not have any clear evidence that uh, uh, we do not know whether it's, uh, work, it works or not. Um, and other um, new drugs, so there's one new drug of, um, coming up, it's called Rendesivir, which is a new drug um, and there's currently a phase three trial in China. 
Um, it is a randomised controlled trial. Um, so it's still early days. We do not know how effective it is going to be. Um, so um, uh, vaccine. So vaccine is in development, uh, but um, it may be still quite some time before we see um, uh, whether th um, it will be efficacious or not. Um, and other uh, medications, so corticosteroids. Um, corticosteroids were used in the Chinese <coughs> series um, of, um, uh, we saw a few weeks ago. Um, again, we do not know how, um, how much benefit it can provide. Um, and um, um, I think that's all of the ones that we know of. Uh, Tamiflu. So Tamiflu was used in one series, but it does not have any in vitro or in vivo activity against um, coronavirus that we know of, but it was used in some series. Um, any other questions? Well, just a, there's a question here a few people have liked in terms of um, cases of asymptomatic transmission. Um, Kat, would you like to talk to that or tell me to... I can, I'm happy to start. So um, clearly a critical question. Kat touched on this with the case definition, um, with the definition for contacts being including the 24 hours before the symptom onset in a confirmed case. So when we have a, a, for a confirmed case in Australia, we're looking at people who've been in contact for the 24 hours before the symptoms start as well as the time that they're symptomatic. And that's because of this concern exactly behind this question. Is it possible that cases actually are, are infectious before their symptoms start, so when they're asymptomatic? And if, if it happens, it, it's definitely unusual. Um, so what we'd expect is that infectious, infectiousness most closely um, uh, aligns with the period of people's symptoms and, and viral shedding. There's a couple of examples uh, in the literature that look to point to this possibility, um, but they really are just a, a couple. Um, and, uh, and you might have heard about the, the Bavarian, the, the German example, where um, the lady, the, the story of asymptomatic transmission was followed up by a, a semi-retraction in, in subsequent days and maybe that person had early mild symptoms. But, so, important question. We've incorporated the possibility in the definition of context, so clearly alive to this being an issue that's a, uh, an appropriately conservative approach. If it is happening, it's uncommon and, uh, and unusual. But Katie, would you like to comment any further on that? Um, yeah, um, so the other um, debatable um, issue is whether these patients could be pre-symptomatic rather than asymptomatic at the time of um, transmission. Um, so um, uh, we do not know the answers yet, so we're still learning about this disease. Okay, um, any other questions from the floor? Yes. Um, Tony, given the number of people in China that are clearly affected, and, and obviously a lot of that's um, milder clinical symptoms from what we're already are beginning to understand about this, this whole thing's not going to go away in a hurry. We've spent an awful lot of resources in just two months um, getting organised, but this is not going to disappear or be cured, particularly with the, the numbers across China and, and obviously moving into other areas. Um, so how do you see this playing out in the, in the longer term? Are we going to be on high alert until such time as there is a vaccine or how does, how does it play out? Yeah, look, it's a great question and obviously nobody has a, a clear answer to that in Australia. No obvious change in... in uh, you wouldn't say it's peaking in China, for example, although there are predictions that might happen in the next month or two, so that'll be interesting to watch. Critically close to home, like we, we said that the containment story in Australia at the moment um, is a success story, so at, at enormous uh, uh, effort and expense, uh, literally expense, obviously a huge impact on just tens of thousands of, of people. Um, so that's successful, but obviously not something that will be maintained indefinitely. Um, and at some stage, th there will be um, very much the, the risk of um, uh, more importations into Australia and the possibility that um, local transmission becomes established. 
Um, part of the early response is, you know, keep everything at bay while we learn as much as we can, give ourselves a chance to prepare, both in terms of health services and ultimately vaccines and therapeutic understandings and so forth. So um, part of the response is we'll delay and then get ready for uh, um, easing the transition to um, widespread infection if that's indeed what happens later on. Um, and we don't know. So successful containment, but it's um, certainly reasonable to say we're all preparing for the potential for a, a next stage um, in terms of health system readiness here um, with hospitals um, at a, a state and Australian government level, um, considering what would be involved in a stage that wasn't containment like now, but dealing with more widespread infection. And that's definitely part of the rationale for tonight, is, is to help people to be ready in primary care for a situation where um, we, we move past four cases in New South Wales and there's a more widespread risk and we all need to be ready for that stage. So uh, clearly nobody knows, but lots of planning going into you know, the, the strong possibility that we go to more expense, extensive infection in Australia. Yep. Medical literature, I've read a suggestion that the incubation period could be up to 24 days. Um, no, thank you. So that's um, a fairly new paper, but actually that's a preprint, meaning that that paper uh, has not been peer reviewed as yet. Um, but uh, but we'll we'll watch the space. So because that paper described um, more than 1,000 patients in China, um, so if um, after it's been peer reviewed and published, then um, we trust it a bit more. Okay, so um, but it did describe the incubation period of 24 days. But what we understand so far is that it, um, and uh, according to what New South Wales has recommended, the incubation period um, is thought to be about 14 days, but the median is thought to be more um, five to six days. Um, from what we understand. But of the New South Wales cases, we learned um, three of the four cases had um, uh, not so long incubation period, but one of the four patients had a longer incubation period of 10 days. So it's quite variable. Thanks, Katie. And yeah, and certainly underlining that that particular case was a, an outlier in that series. Um, so it's a good question. The, the understanding of this disease is still evolving. Um, I suppose that dovetails into this other question about super spreaders. Um, and again, that's something that kind of really catches media attention. You've probably heard about the recent unfortunate British national that probably picked up the coronavirus in Singapore and then sort of sprinkled it around a French chateau. And <laughs> um, uh, I think it was 11 is the body count, or oh, sorry, the, the hit rate at the moment. Um, so look, I mean, there, there are stories um, with other coronaviruses as well uh, in terms of, um, you know, MERS, for example, in Republic of Korea and super spreaders in, in healthcare settings. So there's a lot that remains unknown, but there is actually work happening um, at national and global levels to address these knowledge gaps so um, you know there's involvement of public health authorities in Australia to conduct um, for example f the first few hundred um, surveillance which is really trying to ramp up and enhance our understanding of those first few cases that come through so really scrutinizing um, them and their patterns of you know where they might have picked up the disease and, and the onward transmission routes. So a lot of that work and those protocols and that research is, is sort of co-evolving as we speak. Yeah, one, one question I see has just come in around the transport of viral swabs. Um, so do they, should they always be put in a viral transport medium for the samples? Katie, how do you feel about responding to that? Um, so um, the laboratory should be contacted um, um, in these circumstances. So, um, yes, it should be transported in the appropriate medium, yes. Um, yeah. Um, so we do have um, courier time every day. So, um, and um, so, um, but if it's urgent, so um, urgent couriers can be called to um, help you in terms of the delivery of the specimens to the reference laboratories. And we can certainly put that question up to some laboratory colleagues as well, because all of the question, uh, all of the tests which are um, 
performed at private laboratories do get referred on to the reference laboratory. So it's a good question if, if they need to be in the correct medium. We, I think we partly answered this, but there was a question just to, to make sure. With Bill, who we've got to know quite well tonight and has had variable symptom onset, he hasn't always been straight with us about his timing, but, but um, suspected of having infection and, and, in fact, swabbed at the clinic. So the question is, in regard to isolating himself, what's the next step? What would be our advice and for, for how long? So I guess that's a... Waiting for the test. Who would like to answer that? Oh, that, yep, yeah, I, can, I, <laughs> I can do that, yes. Um, so uh, essentially it would be isolation. Well, I mean, Trish can speak to this, but the advice that we've been giving is that people should be observing, you know, usual respiratory precautions. So if they have respiratory symptoms that they would not normally go into work with, then, you know, just treat it as per good respiratory etiquette and hygiene. Um, in terms of his isolation, so he returned on the, what date? Yes. 10th of Feb. So he would still be subject to, irrespective of his test result, he would still be subject to that quarantine until um, March. <laughs> What's the, yes. Um, yes, so he, he would still be subject to, to quarantine, um, irrespective of his test results. Um, so the CEC guidelines uh, state that um, he would need to be afebrile for 48 hours um, without the use of antipyretics. Um, he would need to have a resolution of his acute illness for greater than 24 hours. Uh, it needs to be seven days since the onset of symptoms. And um, then they go on to talk about PCR uh, screening and two negative swabs, but we've already said that's probably not the best route down which to go. So really it's seven days since the onset of symptoms, um, uh, afebrile for 48 hours and um, that no respiratory symptoms for the previous 24 hours. Thanks, Trish. Yes, that's for confirmed. So for suspected, it's just the um, quarantine from the last exposure. Um, but for confirmed, yes, that's still sort of being worked out. Mm. Great. No, I think we've done... Any other questions around the room? Okay. Well, we might just wrap up with... I mean, we've touched on this, but there was just a question about where does the panel think that this is all heading? <laughs> Did you want to wrap up uh, with that, Tony? I wonder if we've partly yep. covered that, but... Um, do you want to add to that? <laughs> sure. So, I mean, it certainly it does sound like this fulfills criteria for a pandemic. So there is, you know, obviously person-to-person -person spread. It's got the capability of causing disease in humans um, and the potential to spread to other countries. Um, and so we are seeing the, the emerging stages and certainly the, the knowledge is evolving. So um, we just had this slide up. So this was, I think, about three days ago, Public Health England revised their travel um, criteria and considerations for suspect cases. So there's a, a number of things, and if you are on that Johns Hopkins map, you will see that the red bubbles are expanding in locations outside of China. So this, it probably is a matter of uh, when rather than if, in terms of seeing more widespread transmission in Australia, but in terms of where it's headed, in terms of case fatality rates um, and demand on health services, I suppose that remains to be seen. Right. Uh, and uh, important question still to be answered. You, you saw a uh, touch a little bit about uh, a little on unknowns around just how infectious, you know, what, what will the transmissibility be in terms of R0 in time with infection control measures, control measures in place. Um, it, it's unclear exactly how severe it's going to be in terms of its impact with mortality. Clearly not as severe as SARS, more severe than seasonal flu, somewhere in that spectrum. And that, that's a wide range and that's a critical area for us to learn more about in the time ahead. And that'll have a, a, have a, a key influence on just how it plays out in the Australian context. All right. Well, it's been a, a great discussion tonight and we want to thank you all for your engagement and interest in, in this topic. Um, and as we've said, it's a fairly dynamic situation, so we'll do our best to um, keep you updated. Um, should I mention the health pathways? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Did we mention health pathways? <laughs> so, I'm 
I'm sure many of you are active users. So I'll just pass this on. But just a quick look at what it looks like. Um, so just from the home page, there's a link straight there. Um, and the stepwise assessment is listed out and contains drop down boxes in terms of the suspect case definition, which, as we said, may change, um, maybe even in the next few days, depending on travel advisories. Um, and then there's also further advice and links in terms of collection centres that are offering testing, um, recommended PPE, um, and then a, a range of resources collated there as well, as well as your definitions of the different contacts. So it's, it's a great resource and I'd encourage you to have a bit of a look at it in detail and give us any feedback. <laughs> thank you, Scott. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Thanks, Kat. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank everybody. If we can just um, thank our panel, <laughs> which was very informative. Um, and for those people online, if they can just um, use the feedback button just to let us know what you thought, if you've got any, I suppose, um, think that you weren't covered tonight and you would like, I'm sure we can pass that on to um, Kat and Tony. And maybe some just some feedback in terms of future in terms of ongoing education, if there's any other requirements or people like that. I'm sure Tony and Kat, if the situation um, escalates, I'm sure they'll be getting that information out and we'd be happy to put on something on um, later on if that's the case. And um, for those that are here, if you could just, um, if you have, you've got Slido and the same thing in terms of feedback, it's just really valuable for us to know whether you thought this was useful, whether we should continue in these sort of things in, in the future. So um, I think with that, oh, Sandra. Oh. Um, we're updating the pathway pretty much daily in conjunction with Kat and Tony. So if, if you go to the pathway to find something and it's not there, just click the feedback button and we'll have it on by the next morning. Please. So that's this little blue button. Yeah. Click that, yeah, and they'll provide. All right, great. Thanks very much, everyone, for your attendance and um, have a good evening. <laughs>